Right, I feel almost as though I should introduce myself all over again. It's been a week and a half since we had a lecture. So let me begin by reminding you of what we were doing. Uh, we had derived all of the plain roots, and for better or for worse, had put them behind us. And then we moved into three dimensions where things get a lot more involved and a lot more complicated, and to say the least, a lot more numerous. And the first question we asked was to say, when we're in a three-dimensional space, we can combine a first rotation operation with a second rotation operation in theta. If we're to begin by deriving the point groups, that is to say, at least one point in this three-dimensional space is left unmoved, uh, we want the two axes to intersect the point. For a space group, that could be parallel to one another, but that's going to be an infinite set of symmetry elements and operations that extends through all the space. Then we ask the question rhetorically, because you knew I was going to answer it, uh, what is the uh, net, uh, net result of a sequence of rotating from a first object to a second, and then picking up the second and rotating it by through an angle beta, not the second axis, to get the third one here. Uh, what is the net effect? And again, we could do that by the process of elimination. It uh, has to be either translation or another rotation, because these are the only two generic sorts of operations which leave the chirality unchanged. And I think I convinced you that indeed there was some third axis C, which rotated directly from the first to the third by some different angle gamma. So that is the consequence of combining the first two rotation axes. What we would anticipate is that the location and also the value of the rotation <laughs> depends on alpha and beta and also the angle at which we combine them, and that's little c. Uh, you can do this in a number of ways if you don't insist that gamma turn out to be a crystallographic rotation, and then the, the result would be true, but it would not be a rotation operation which could exist in a three-dimensional point group. So, using the genius of Leonard Euler uh, in a construction known as Euler's construction, we set up a little uh, spherical triangle which we could analyze. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Euler because he is a remarkable individual. The first remarkable feature of Euler is that he's Swiss, and uh, there are not many world-class famous people who are Swiss simply because the population is so small that the probability of somebody rising to heights is constant among all populations. If you have a small population, there are not going to be very many. And to demonstrate that point, can somebody identify some other citizen of Switzerland who rose to great heights and is world famous at another world? Think of one other person. I'm probably pressed to do so myself. Who's my uncle, but he actually didn't amount to much. Um, but there is an artist, Paul Clay, who is world class. He was one of the uh, early modern artists. And Switzerland has just finished constructing a uh, marvelous museum on the outskirts of the capital city, Bern. It's a structure that is supposed to mimic the rolling countryside of the central part of Switzerland. So it's a series of cylindrical structures, glass in front, glass on top, and it uh, divides the uh, area into three. Uh, two of them are exhibit spaces, and one is a space for scholars and research. And it's an absolutely marvelous structure. Uh, it appeared in the pages of Time Magazine when it opened about two months ago. Anyway, uh, Euler was born in 1707, so he operated a long time ago. And he died in St. Petersburg on September 18, 1783. Uh, that is exactly 350 years and one day after my birthday. Um, that's another remarkable thing about him. He was 76 years old when he died. In that time of uh, primitive medicine and plague, not many people got to live to their 60s and 70s. Uh, Euler studied at the uh, University of Basel, 
under the Bernoullis. I think you've all heard of the Bernoullis. There's a very famous principle of physics known as the Bernoulli effect, which stated in its simple practical form says that if you have a Sunday paper on the front seat alongside of you and you drive your car with the windows down, the paper will blow out the window. That's Bernoulli's principle in action. Euler got his doctorate from Basel at age 16. Sort of leads one to the rhetorical question, how come you guys have been spinning your wheels for so long? But then I said he was an unusual individual. Um, the Bernoullis went to St. Petersburg in Russia under Catherine I. Russia was trying very hard at that time to enter uh, the ranks of the Western world as a full member. Um, Euler followed them a little bit later on, and he succeeded one of the Bernoullis as a professor of mathematics in 1733. Now, unfortunately, <coughs> two years later, in 1735, he lost the sight of one eye. And why? Because at that time, astronomy and using this new angle telescope, which had recently been perfected, one of the hottest things going was studying the heavens, looking through a telescope. And if you wanted to look at the sun, people knew nothing about the damaging effect on retinas of the sun's rays. So he lost the sight of one eye. 1741, he went back to Europe again, to Berlin. Why? Uh, because the reigning monarch in Russia at that time was called Ivan the Terrible. And that says, dreams about why well, one could want to get out of Russia. But then 1776, he went back to St. Petersburg under the next monarch who was Catherine the Great. And that says why one would be anxious to go back. Finally, in 1766, he went totally blind. Did that slow him down? Not one bit. Uh, he published in his lifetime 800 papers. He talked to some big cheese around MIT. They published maybe two or 300 uh, papers. And then, with the assistance of an army of graduate students, and also, one might add, the assistance of Xerox machines and word processors. So back in the days when you wrote everything out by hand with a Procopil pen, 800 papers is an absolutely unbelievable accomplishment. It took 35 years after he passed away to publish everything that he had written. People were kept busy publishing what he did. And uh, among his accomplishments, he was one of the first people to apply real hardcore mathematics to astronomy to make it quantitative. He uh, was one of the first to suggest that light was a waveform and that color was a function of wavelength. That was astonishingly pre precocious. And then, unless he seemed like an egghead who spent all his time staring through uh, telescopes and working out. Uh, theorems of use in crystallography. He also wrote a popular account of science for the general public, which was published in 1768. And that book was published for 90 years. Three generations of people kept gobbling up that book, so it was pretty good. He impinged upon our own language and uh, activities in several important ways. He was the one who used lowercase i to define the square root of minus one. We can thank Euler uh, for that. Uh, he was the person who used E to define the constant 2.7.1828.4590.4523536. And he was the person who first used F to stand for function. So he contributed not only a lot of good math mathematics, but a lot to our language of math. So this does not have to be easy. Weber was a great guy. And uh, this geometry of rotations about different uh, axes is something that also survives in a mechanism that involves achieving an angular orientation of an axis by rotation on two orthogonal arcs. And that's something that's called an Eulerian frame. And that is a, a geometry that's used in a great number of mechanical devices. And then it gets back to the construction for our purposes. Um, the thing that we would like to do is that alpha and beta take on all possible crystallographic values, namely 
360 degrees on one fold axis, although we know that that's not going to work. Um, Two-fold, 180 degrees, three-fold, 120, four-fold, 90, six-fold, uh, 60. And let that give the values to alpha and beta, taken two at a time. And then let us ask the question, at what angle should we combine these two axes to get gamma to be the crystallographic rotation axis? And if it is crystallographic and not something like 37.9234 degrees, what are the remaining axes, the interaxial angles, B and A? So this is the problem that Euler's construction solved. And I won't go through all the arguments that we used to set this up, but what we found after some not obvious sleight of hand, namely working on the polar triangle with spherical trigonometry, what we found was a result that said that if we want to combine two axes alpha and beta so that the third one turned out to be rotation gamma, then the cosine of the angle between A and B should be the cosine of alpha over 2, cosine of beta over 2, plus cosine of gamma over 2, divided by sine of alpha over 2, sine of beta over 2. So you pick your alpha and beta, and you decide what you would want these first two rotations to turn out to be. And generally, it's not going to work. But there are a surprising number of cases where it does work. To specify the combination, you have to also determine the angle between A and C. And you have to also determine the angle between the axes B and C. And there are similar sorts of expressions that one obtains simply by perfectly alpha beta again. So then we set it up just by looking at all possible combinations of two, full, of two different rotation axes and the third, which their net effect might be. Uh, we're not interested in permuting A, B, and C, and A with a C with a B is just as interesting or not as an A with a B with a C. So we don't care about permutations. And, uh, we generated, just as we parted the company a week and a half ago, a set of uh, combinations that we should consider. Uh, what the, the axis A would be, what the axis B would be, and then different choices for the axis C. So A could be a 1, B could be a 1, and we could look for 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 1, 1, 4, 1, 1, 6. Those are legitimate combinations. Those are absurd combinations. Because doing nothing about the first one-fold axis, doing nothing about the second one-fold axis, could hardly result in the net effect of a 90-degree rotation about the third axis. And we thought I suggested is that sitting around doing nothing twice was equal to a rotation. We all, at junctures in our day, wouldn't find ourselves spinning on our axes like tops. Uh, A two-fold axis. One, one, two we have here, so we don't have to consider two, one, one. But we should consider two, one, two, two, one, three, two, one, four, two, one, six, and uh, so on. And we filled out this whole table last time. We've got a copy of it and some notes. And all that remains then is to plug each up and see where we get allowable axial combinations. And not surprisingly, there are very, very few. And we showed, again, when we finished up last time, that you can always take any n-fold axis that has a c gamma that's equal to c 2 pi over n, and combine it with two-fold axes at right angles, provided you make the angle between the two-fold axes equal to gamma over 2. So the crystallographic possibilities for C are, first of all, C could be a two-fold axis, in which case you could combine with it a pair of two-fold axes, and this one-half of 180 degrees would also be the right angle. Uh, we could let C be a 
threefold axis, in which case the twofold axes have to be at right angles to the threefold axes, and they should be combined at half the angular throw of the threefold axes, which, which is six, 60 degrees. Two more possibilities are four with a pair of twofold axes at right angles. Uh, the angle between them, half of the throw of a fourfold axis would have to be 45 degrees. And the last one is a sixfold axis with a pair of twofold axes at right angles to it and uh, 30 degrees apart. So notice the insidious fact that the angle between the twofold axes is always half or half the rotation angle of the principal axis C and not equal to its rotation axis. The other thing we saw that is that these twofold axes are different distinct symmetry independent axes. They're different in that the principal axis C never rotates this axis into the second one and therefore demands that what is going on around one twofold axis be identical to what's going on about the other twofold axis. Different in the sense that uh, they function in different ways in the pattern or in describing the symmetry of uh, an object. So probably the best illustration of this is a regular prism uh, with a triangular shape or with a square shape or with an hexagonal shape. And the adjacent twofold axes for these prisms would come out of the normal to a face. And then if the second twofold axis is going to be 45 degrees away from the first, uh, the other one has to come out of the corner. So again, they function in different ways in the space. One is normal to the face of a regular prism, if that's what's in our space. The other one comes out of the edge. Similarly, for a six-fold uh, axis, an hexagonal prism has one two-fold axis coming out normal to the face, the adjacent two-fold axis coming out from the edge, and as advertised, that angle is 30 degrees, so they function in different ways. The only exception to that, again, is the weirdo three-fold axis, and the two-fold axis there, if they're 60 degrees apart, come out of one side from the corner of a triangular prism on the other side out of the face. So all of the twofold axes do the same thing. There's only one independent kind of twofold axis, just as there was only one kind of mirror plane in the combination of a mirror plane passing through a twofold axis. The names for these are always, as we've done in the past, a running list of the independent symmetry operations that are present. So this general one, N22, would be an n-fold axis or some generic sort of two-fold axis. This one would be 222, this one would be 422, and this one would be 622. Uh, this on ball with a three-fold axis is again called not 322, but 32, because there's only one kind of two-fold axis just as there was only one kind of error. Pause and suck at air, see if you have any questions. These are the crystallographic combinations of this sort. There is no reason why you could, should not, in something that doesn't have to be compatible with a lattice, combine an n fold axis of any sort uh, with two fold axes at right angles. And indeed, if I look at my old friend, the Samoro Campus, we can have anything like. Uh, 28 up to 32 fold symmetry. Um, this actus step had a 28 fold symmetry. There would be a two fold axis coming out of the, the extreme of one of the ribs, another two fold axis coming out of the crevice between a pair of these ribs. And if I took that thing up very carefully because of the spines and with great effort because it weighs several tons and rotated it 
about one axis and then rotate it again about the second axis, turning it upside down, and then it's actually going to be rotation to 128 of the circuit. Valid symmetry, but not the first little graph. Okay, any comments or questions? Get to know these results because the exercise that's going to occupy us for the uh, next week is going to be asking how we can decorate these frameworks with mirror planes and with inversion. In one orientation, if we add another operation to the collection of axes, what pops up? Where should, should we look for it? Comments or questions? Okay, uh, there are only two other combinations that are crystallographic that involve directions that are not simple. And one of them involves a combination of a threefold axis with two full axes that come out of directions that are normal to the face of the cube. So these turn out to be very, very strange angles, which make no sense at all until uh, you refer them to directions in the cube. The direction of the threefold axis turns out to be corresponding to the diagonal of the cube. The direction of the twofold axis corresponds to the normal two faces. You can show, I did show, and I don't think anybody really followed me, so I had a hand out that will give you after intermission, that if you start with one two-fold axis and one three-fold axis, what you're going to get is a three-fold axis coming out of all of the body diagonals, but they're all equivalent to this three-fold axis. And two-fold axes come out to normal for all the faces. There's only one kind of two-fold axis, one kind of three-fold axis. So even though we got this by combining a pair of two-fold axes, I'm sorry, a pair of three-fold axes. What happens when you say literally? Forget about this one. A pair of three-fold axes out of diagonals and one two-fold axis. And this is the combination that is called two-three, because there's only one sort of two-fold axis, one sort of three-fold axis. And uh, I point out again, I'd like to warn you of traps when we come across them, make sure we don't fall across them. Notice the insidious relation of this pair of integers to the symmetry that we label 2, 3, 2. 3, 2 is a threefold axis with a twofold axis normal to it. Um, 2, 3 is this combination that involves directions in a cube. Now let me pause parenthetically with an aside. You might say, how can this be? Here is a cube. That cube has got a fourfold axis about it. Uh, don't call that a twofold axis. The cube has a fourfold axis coming out. Okay, let me give you an example in, in real life. There is a uh, fairly common mineral, iron disulfide. All right. This forms nice shiny cubes, but the cube faces have striations on them. If you look at them, there's a set of lines running this way. And what those lines are, if you look at this crystal face with a magnifying glass, is that these are little steps uh, of a second face. And this is a face of the form HK0. And this oscillates back and forth, and you seem to be lines scribed on the surface. So this sort of oscillatory crystal growth of one phase, which never really develops, is not that uncommon. There's a threefold axis coming out of the corner here, but this is really a surface that is left invariant only by 180 degrees. Okay. You cannot rotate that surface 90 degrees. The orientation of the lines have changed. But there is a bona fide threefold axis coming up here. So these striations. If I rotate down to this space, we'll go in a way like this. This edge turns into this edge, and therefore the lines will run down like this. If I rotate it again by 90 degrees, the striations 
on the adjacent face. So there's a decorated cube, and if you hold it up and say, how can I move this cube around and leave its appearance totally unchanged? The answer is, rotate it by 120 degrees and let it by angle, but you can only rotate it 180 degrees around the face. So there's an example of a crystal which really is based on the arrangement of rotation axes, 2, 3. The final one, the highest symmetry of all, involves a fourfold axis coming out of a direction normal to a face, a threefold axis coming out of a body diagonal, and a twofold axis coming out normal to an edge. And if you let these axes work on one another, there's a twofold axis yeah, that comes out of every edge, and a fourfold axis that comes out of every face. And this one is named 432 because it's a combination of a fourfold, a threefold, and a twofold. That is the symmetry of the cube. And for crystallographic symmetries, that's about as uh, complicated as it gets. Now, if we look at the regular solids that we've encountered here, um, when symmetry 2 3, there is a regular figure. Uh, consisting of four triangular faces, that's a tetrahedron. And for 432, one of the polyhedra that can form from the crystal of this scene is an octahedron. These were the lovely uh, solids called conic solids uh, after Plato uh, that we used as our trophies earlier this afternoon. So this is an octahedron. Let me finish up before our break by asking, is there any other regular polyhedron that can result from combination of rotation axes that are not crystallographic? Now that's a tough question to ask. So instantly uh, uh, scan your, your knowledge of uh, Geometry. Clearly, there are a lot of prisms, uh, there are an infinite number of prisms of the form n but there's only one other combination of axes, non crystallographic, which results in a regular polyhedron. And this is a combination, believe it or not, of a five fold axis with a three fold axis. is a regular solid called an icosahedron. And that is so complicated that I wouldn't attempt to draw it. But having said so, it looks like this. It has diamond-shaped faces. And there are five of these that come together in a, at a corner. and then there are two other ones that come in like this. So there are one, two, three, four, five faces. So this is the orientation of the five-fold axis. The two-fold axis comes out of the place where two of these edges uh, are shared. And the uh, three-fold axis, actually triangular faces. Faces. 
I think it's not sure. You just say you know the number of cases. Yeah, but I can't tell you everything in that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another figure uh, which also has this symmetry, and it's a regular solid. And this is called a rhombic dodecahedron. Guy, this has 12 faces. <laughs> and the faces are pentagonal. And there are three pentagonal faces that come together at a threefold axis, a fivefold axis out of each of the pentagonal faces, and a twofold axis out of the edges. The fact that this has 12 faces at regular intervals leads a uh, entrepreneur who is familiar with injection molding to cast these little things out of plastic and then puts a month of the year on each of the 12 faces and you have a nice little desk calendar. It is uh, something that reminds you of symmetry as well as telling you what month of the year it is. So this has, uh, has uh, five, five full faces, 12 of them. And that's the rhombic dodecahedron as opposed to the normal dodecahedron, which is a dodecahedron. So are those both five pages? I'm sorry. Are those both five pages? The icosahedron is not rhombic. Yeah, this, this has five-fold axis coming out of the pentagonal face. Is that what you're asking? And the three-fold axis, there are three of them that come together. And, uh, do something like this. So here's the threefold, here's the fivefold, here's the twofold. Here we have to see it. Look for somebody who's done one of these desk calendars. Who used to sell your regular computer? Okay, this sets up the next stage of our game. We've got these arrangement of axes, and if you count them up on the fingers of your hands and one toe, there are 11 of them. There are the axes by themselves, one fold, two fold, three fold, four fold, four fold, six fold. There are the so-called dihedral combinations, where the only thing that changes from one to the other is the symmetry of the main axis, the highest symmetry, and therefore the dihedral angle between the twofold axes. And these are 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 2, and 6, 2, 2. And then the two cubic arrangements, 3, 2, and 4, 3, 2. So when we return, we'll ask the question, how can we add mirror planes for an inversion center to this combination of axes? And these are going to give us new symmetries involving not only rotation, but God help us rotation and inversion as well. And the constraint in doing this is that we have to add the reflection plane and the inversion center in such a way that it doesn't create any new rotation axes. Because we have systematically derive all of the possible combinations of crystallographic rotation axes. So if the addition of a mirror plane creates a new axis, that's going to be something that we already have with a, com a combination of a greater number of rotation axes. For example, we could take a single two-fold axis and a mirror plane at an angle that generated another two-fold axis 90 degrees away, but we've already got that. If the mirror plane moves an axis to an angle that doesn't correspond to one of these arrangements, it's going to be impossible because we have systematically derived using Euler's construction all the combinations of rotation operations that are possible. So that's going to be the constraint. We we'll want to add mirror planes or an inversion center in all possible combinations. And this means we're going to need a theorem. What happens when you add a mirror plane to a rotation operation? We're already familiar with one of them. You take an axis and you pass a mirror plane through it, you get another mirror plane that is rotated about the axis away from the first by half the rotation angle of the axis. 
So let's take a breather and uh, let us uh, resume in uh, about 10 minutes.